around. And so you work up your courage and you're going to ask her and you think about all these things and you're like, all of a sudden you've talked yourself out of it because there's no way she would like a guy like you, right? We've all kind of been there before. We've all had that scenario happen. But what I want us to see this morning as we walk through the word is, is the simple truth this morning that sometimes we, we get in our heads, so to speak. And one of the places that we do that is in the way that we respond to the brokenness in our world, to the suffering, to the pain, to the brokenness, to the sin that has reached into the world. A lot of times we look at things and we think, okay, this is bad. And then all of a sudden we start thinking about it a little bit more. And then we see another news story. We see another news story. We see another thing. We think about another thing. And all of a sudden we get in our heads and things just go crazy, right? This is going to happen. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. And so Pastor Matt Chandler says that what we do a lot of times as believers uh, in this book called Take Heart, he says there's three ways that we typically respond to the brokenness in our culture. The first thing that we try to do is we try to convert the culture. He says in his book, he says that we fear that we are losing the culture, and if we do not make the compromises necessary to continue the culture war, the church cannot thrive or even survive. He says what matters most in this mindset, what matters most is that our nation's culture reflects biblical principles and values. He says another way that we respond is that we try to condemn the culture. We fear that the culture will corrupt us and the church, that any connection will lead to contamination and the church will become sick. So we remove ourselves from the world. We retreat into a subculture and stay away from wider culture because society is sinful, corrupted, and antithetical or directly opposed to the gospel. And then the other way that we respond is we consume the culture. He says we fear that the church will become unacceptable or irrelevant or not cool enough. And so, uh, we, we, uh, so what we do is we change things. We compromise the message. We try to attract all these people. He says these are the three ways that we typically respond. And all of these responses are based out of fear. But what we have as we open the Word of God, and what we're going to see this morning as, as we open the Word of God, is that God would not have us respond to the brokenness in our world uh, out of fear, but rather out of confidence and courage. And so this morning as we, we look through Romans chapter 8, and we'll go back to some things that we've already covered, and we'll uh, go to another uh, section. But what I want us to see is that as we, uh, as we face a, a broken world, because let's just get honest, we're not living in Genesis 1 and 2 anymore, right? We're not living in the garden. Everything's not perfect. Everything's not, you know, peachy, so to speak. That We live in a broken world. We look all around us. You look at the newspaper. You, uh, I don't even think people still do that anymore. Uh, you watch the news. You get on, uh, on the internet. You see all of the brokenness and all of the heartbreak in our world. And so we're not denying that. But what I want us to, rather, what I want us to do as a church is that we, we take hope and we take courage. Courage and we take confidence as we face the brokenness. And we're not trying to live in our little holy huddle and hide out from everybody else. Nor are we trying to compromise our beliefs or trying to compromise the truth of Scripture so that everybody will just feel good about themselves. Rather, that we would have boldness and courage and confidence because that's what God would have us to have. To be salt and light in our world. And so this morning, Romans chapter 8, that's what we're going to be encouraged to do. What we're going to be encouraged to be uh, through Paul's words to the Romans. And so let's begin looking in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Paul says this. He says, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because, uh, because of him who subjected it in hope. That's one of your key words or phrases right there. In hope. Hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who, are, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for... Who hopes for what, is, uh, for what he sees? Verse 25 then. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And so as we open this passage, as we begin to walk through this passage, the first thing that we see is this acknowledgement of suffering and pain in the world. And again, I don't think any of us here are trying to deny hey, there's nothing broken in this world, right? So we see it. You go and you can kind of highlight these phrases if you want to. The sufferings of this present time. Creation was subjected to futility, that it's in the 
bondage of corruption. The whole creation has been growing together in the pains of childbirth until now. And how even we ourselves groan inwardly as we wait eagerly. And so Paul is painting this picture of brokenness in the world. And again, we know we're not living in a Genesis 1 and 2 world. Rather, we're living in a Genesis 3 world. A world that doesn't respond to the, the, the beliefs of God quite like they did once before, right? And so we look at that, and a lot of times, again, we want to live in despair and in fear, and like, oh, the world's just not like it used to be. But it, of course it's not. It's not like it was in the beginning. And so from Genesis 3 all the way to 2019, right? It's still 2019. Anybody still write 2018 on their, uh, on their paperwork? Um, and so it's March, people. Uh, is it March? Yeah, it's March. Okay. Anyway. Anyway. Um, so what, what we're seeing here is this idea that we are not living in a Genesis 1 and 2 world. Rather, we're living in a Genesis 3 world, a world that has been plagued by sin. And what we see as we walk through this passage is that it has far-reaching effects. That it has reached into every aspect of our lives, and it's also reached into every aspect of creation. That's what Paul's saying. He says when the creation groans, it's hurting, it's in pain, it's, it's living in futility, even creation. John Calvin says... The condemnation of mankind is imprinted on the heavens and on the earth and all creation. So we see the far reaching effects of sin. But what Paul would have us to do is not to sit in a little holy huddle or sit, you know, like rocking back and forth out of fear and trembling, but would rather have us have courage and confidence. And so what do we have courage and confidence in? I believe there's a couple things that we kind of see in this passage of Scripture. The first thing that Paul reminds them of is what lies behind them. Now, he doesn't necessarily talk about what lies behind them so much in verses 18 to 25. We actually need to look back a little bit to see what lies behind them because that sets us up, up for the other point that he makes here is what lies before them or ahead of them. So let's look at what lies behind them. Behind them. So let's go back and look now. Romans chapter 8, verse 12. Paul says this. He says, So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live... According to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are now sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and of children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. And so what lies behind us is the foundation for everything. What lies behind us, what God has done in the past, is the foundation that we build our lives on. It's the foundation that our courage and our confidence and our faith and our trust and our fearlessness and our boldness and our purpose in life, it's what our lives are built on. And so what does he say? He says, you're no longer debtors. He says, you're no longer enemies of God. You're no longer aliens. You're no longer orphans. Now, what does he say? He says, you have the spirit of adoption to now to the point where you cry out, Abba, Father, this desperate longing, this desperate cry to connect intimately with the Father. I've been called a lot of things in my life. Um, when I was in high school, um, it's just so funny that the things that you, you come to realize. When, when in high school, when I was playing uh, sports, playing basketball, you know, you always are, you're getting out there and you're going to play man-to-man -man defense. And, uh, you know, I've got number so-and-so, and I've got number so-and-so. And, you know, my jersey was a little bit bigger than everybody else's, and so my number was a little bit bigger than everybody else, right? And instead of saying, I've got number 13, they would always call, i got the big guy. Um, and so I was called big guy. I've been called, uh, people are always like, you prefer Nick or Nicholas? And I'm like, it doesn't matter. I mean, I've been called so many things over the course of my life. Sometimes things that should not be repeated. Things that people <laughs> should not be said, uh, should not say about other people, right? But one of my favorite things to, to, to be called is dad. It, it, is, it has changed everything about the way that I view um, myself. But most importantly, it's changed everything about the way that I view God because I know in that cry of Abba, Daddy, Father, that there's this dependence, there's this intimacy, there's this connection, there's this feeling of safe, uh, safety, right? This feeling that nothing is going to happen. Now, I will say the other day, I don't know what day it was, but just the other day, I, I was actually holding Jack and he goes, don't drop me, don't drop me. He's like, I'm going to drop you, right? Uh, on his 
kid, right? <laughs> but that's changed the way that I view, most importantly, myself, but it's changed more than anything the way that I view who God is, that God is my Abba. He is this, uh, this safety net. He's this comforter in the midst of whatever faces me. And so he's, he, Paul says that we have this spirit of adoption. No longer do we have a spirit of slavery and fear. We have a spirit of adoption. And so that changes everything about us. And see what Paul says is he says adoption is that the, these Romans would have believed or would have understood something even more beautiful. Because when you were adopted in Roman culture, you could be adopted as an adult. Uh, anybody ever been like, hey, will you adopt me because you're rich? And, uh, right. <laughs> We've all made those, those kinds of jokes, right? But, but, but uh, maybe a, a, a wealthy man who had a slave that he adored, who had served him faithfully for years and years and years, at some point in that, that slave's life, he could adopt that slave. And so no longer are they slaves. Now they are sons. They are daughters. They belong to the family. And so what that means is that there's a couple things. When you were adopted, even as an adult, a child, whatever it was, your old debts and your legal obligations were paid. Uh, it says it, it, you, you got a new name and you were instantly an heir of all that the father had. Your new father became instantly liable for all of your actions, your debts, your crimes. Uh, and then now the new son has a new obligation to honor and please the father. And so everything has changed about this person who's become a son or a daughter. And what I want us to see as we lay this foundation this morning is that if you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it's changed everything about you. No longer is your past held against you. We're going to look at that a whole lot more next week. But I love Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That past that Satan tries to whisper in your ear and remind you that this time and that time and this time and that time, it's, it's forgiven. That debt has been paid. It has been nailed to the cross. And so no longer is that held against you, but rather you can walk in freedom. And so this spirit of adoption changes everything about us. And then what, is, what does he say? He says in verse, uh, verse 17, so if you're a child of God, you're also a what? An heir. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with Him, in order that we also be glorified with Him. And so, what He's saying now is this: is that you are an heir. Now, in this culture, this uh, the the, art, the oldest son, the firstborn son, was the one who received the lion's share of the inheritance. Uh, everybody else just kind of got like sloppy seconds and leftovers. Like uh, you get the you know all of the cool whip bowls that you know mom put all the leftovers in. That's your inheritance. <laughs> With not enough lids to match, right? <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe it's not cool. Maybe it's country crop, whatever it is, uh, in your home, <laughs> in your family. But we, we all know we, we're from the South. We know, right? Um, sorry. But what we see here is you're not getting sloppy seconds. You're not getting leftovers. What he says is that we are all heirs. That we all get the fullness of God. We get the full glory, the full beauty, the full everything of God. That we are all the firstborn son. We are all full recipients, full inheritance, full heirs of what God has done for us. And so then that leads us, so we've, we've talked about what, what lies behind us. And so now that leads us to what lies before us. And so what is our inheritance? You go back and you look through this passage. I consider the sufferings of this present time. They're not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And so Paul says, look, what's going on in your life right now, the sufferings that you're dealing with, he's not really referencing persecution, but in the future he's going to be writing so many letters to churches that have been persecuted. And so we can kind of hold on to that truth is maybe the church is persecuted in the future or whatever suffering and pain and brokenness and challenges that you face in life, whether it even it goes with aging, whether it goes with a family member who's fallen away, whatever it is in your life, what Paul says here is this, is the pain of the present can't compare to the glory of the future. And so the reason that we have hope, the reason that we have courage, and the reason that we have confidence in the face of a broken world is because we have the hope of a future. That's what Paul's saying. He says, we look right now and all of this brokenness and all of this pain and all of this sin, it's just temporary. It's just here for a moment. It's just a shadow of what is to come because in the end, this passes away, this goes away, and now we enter into glory. And so we don't have to live in hope 
are in fear and despair. Rather, we can live in hope as we look at the brokenness in the world, as we watch the news and we see of the, the, the senseless murders, as we see the, the brokenness again in our own family or wherever it is that we can hold on to the hope of eternity. We don't have to sit in a huddle. We don't have to... We don't have to uh, conform to the culture and just give in and say, well, let's everybody just come. We're, you're okay. I'm okay. We don't have to do that. We can stand firmly, boldly, confidently, and with courage and say that God is the only way to true life. Amen. And so we see that truth here, that we have a hope. I love the way that uh, pastor and theologian, well, he's since passed away, but R.C. Sproul says it this way. He says, when you are discouraged by your trouble, know that what is to come for you in Christ will be so wonderful that all your pain will be worth it. Isn't that beautiful? When you're discouraged by your troubles, and let's just get honest. Every one of us has some little list of troubles, at least, right? I, I, I say that. I did discover last week in, in our, on our retreat that we have a couple of students that are sinless. Um, I was like, man, you got it going on, right? But every one of us has troubles. Every one of us has struggles. Every one of us has something that is just uh, weighing us down. But we hold on to the hope that knowing what is to come for you in Christ will be so wonderful that all your pain will be worth it. The reason why F.F. Uh, F. Bruce says this, that what is now seen in a limited and distorted fashion will be seen in perfection when the people of God at last attain the goal to which uh, God has had in view for us for all time. Complete conformity to his glorified son. That one day we will look like Jesus. We will stand before the throne of God. We will fall before the throne of God and worship and surrender. And so that is our hope. That's what we, we hold on to as we face the brokenness, as we face whatever it is that's going on in your life. You hold on to the hope that is set before.